Hey, Zach, how are you doing? Hey, doing well. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Thanks for being on. It's great to talk to you again. And I, uh, I do want to thank you also for having me on your show, uh, the Zach Drew Show recently. That was a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to having you on Into the Multiverse, your very first appearance. <laughs> Yes, and it's good to be here, like I said, and we're going to have you back on the show as well. We got uh, a great response, even on the PTL television network, Apple TV, Roku. Uh, you know, People love the stuff that you talk about, Josh. I'm telling you that right now. Well, that's fantastic. All the feedback I hear from you as well uh, is, is similar. Everybody's saying, hey, you know, Josh, if you haven't checked it out, you got to check out the Zach Drew show. You know, it's a great show. And now I can tell people, actually, I was on the show. So thanks. But uh, <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to be talking with you about this subject specifically, because I know that you've done a few past episodes of, of your show uh, on some of this stuff. And, uh, you, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's kind of difficult to find uh, younger people like me and you up to date on Technology, but from a Christian perspective, usually people our age, Absolutely. if they're yeah, if they're if they if they even know what biohacking is or, or neurolinks and all this stuff, usually it's it's uh, in favor of, of those things. It, mm -hmm. It's rare to find uh, people like me and you who are who are our age from our generation and who look at this a little bit more uh, suspiciously from a Christian perspective. And the first thing that I wanted to ask you because I, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with this this term or, or really how important it is and what it means, but I I wanted to ask you, are we in the fourth industrial revolution? And what does that mean for you and I? Because I, again, I imagine not a lot of people uh, have heard that term before, uh, but I know it's something that, that you're quite familiar with. Amen. So uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm glad that you asked that question first, because a lot of other people will ask uh, different types of questions, and it's so important to lay the foundation first for where we're heading. So where we're heading in this interview, uh, it's going to get really deep really quickly, but the foundation is this, that everybody needs to understand that are we in the fourth industrial revolution? I believe that we are. Now, Josh, I believe that we're not far into it, but we have taken a couple of steps, and there are a thousand steps ahead of us, but we have entered into the fourth industrial revolution. Now, first off, you know, we know what the other industrial revolutions are just from, you know, going to even high school or college, learning about the industrial revolutions. Now, here's the thing. In the same way, People, let's say you were born in the year of 1750. You mm -hmm. see, the first Industrial Revolution took place between the years of 1760 and 1840. Okay. If you were living in, in the year of 1750, your brain couldn't even conceive what was about ready to be developed. That's right. where I feel like we are right now. You see, the first Industrial Revolution, basically from 1760 to 1840, it changed the world as we know. You and I, we cannot imagine the world if the first Industrial Revolution hadn't taken place because what it was characterized was by this. Basically, for the most part, everything went from hand production – to what? To machine production. And then the second industrial revolution was from 1870 to 1914, the second industrial revolution. And it was known as the technological revolution, which basically it was the invent of public electricity, the light bulb, the telephone. And it also gave birth to the internal combustion engine, which gave birth to what? planes, trains, and cars. You see, we cannot imagine what the world would be like without those first two industrial revolutions. It's changed the way, it's changed the fabric of our lives, how we operate. Well, then we have the third industrial revolution, which is called the digital revolution, which started in the 1980s. And it was characterized as moving from analog, electric, and mechanical devices to what? To digital technology. Now, many, many things were created during this time period, but it's best known for the personal computer and the internet. Mm -hmm. And now I believe we have just entered into and just taken the first couple of steps into this, Josh, the fourth industrial revolution, and it's building off of the digital revolution. And now here's what's crazy. This is kind of what we're talking about today. This one is going to be characterized by representing new ways in which technology becomes embedded within societies and even the human body. Mm -hmm. The new revolution, it's going to be marked by nanotechnology, quantum computing, autonomous vehicles, robotics, AI, and everything IoT, the Internet of, of Things. In the world of complete connectivity, even you yourself will be connected. So now here's the thing. 
In the same way, I believe we're going to be able to look into the future 20 years. If we were in the future 20 years from today, we would be looking back on 2019 and thinking to ourselves, wow, it's so crazy to think that there was a time period where people were not biohacking their bodies. It's so crazy to think that there was, there, was a, there was a time period where the vast majority of people did not have BCIs in their head, brain computer interface, brain microchips within their bodies. If we could simply just look into the future, we would be – honestly, it, it is a scary future. It really is, Josh. Yeah, and that brings up a good question too, because that that's a topic that comes up quite often, especially uh, you know with, with with things that exist today that that didn't used to before, and that the human mind couldn't even uh, you know imagine just a few decades ago. Things like you know Neuralink and Kernel. Uh, th this brings up the question, and it's an important one: Where do we draw the line when it comes to things like biohacking or upgrading our own bodies? I've kind of expressed my answer to that question in the show before, but I'm curious to know uh, what what your what your thoughts thoughts are. Well, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what yours are too, to see if they differ at all. But for those that say no, never, no biohacking, nothing being inserted into my body ever, we've got to understand that in, in a way, a type of biohacking already exists. Because if you're just like, no way, never, well then, it, God forbid you ever have heart problems where you need a pacemaker. Right, or right? a hip replacement God even. Or a hip, exactly. Yeah. God forbid that your hearing starts to, to leave you, and you have to go get you know cochlear implants to hear right. better. God forbid any of that. Because you see, you see, where do we draw the line? Because we are already getting used to a type of biohacking, but it doesn't stop there. And then you have another category of people that you might they might think to themselves, well, you know what? I don't want to become one with artificial intelligence, but a little better memory might be might be nicer. And you see, and that kind of talks about that's where we are right now with even Neuralink, with mm -hmm. Elon Musk's uh, new company that was established in 2017, developing BCIs. And we have even other you know, companies like Kernel. I want to talk about this just for a second. You see, yeah. and I want to set the stage with this. You see, it, it was at a, an event at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco last month that Elon Musk talked about the radical advances that Neuralink has made since it was founded in 2017. And Josh, I'm sure you know all about it. They, it is insane. It is, it is so radical to see how far they have come. Now remember, Neuralink, so they're, they're the ones that are developing and creating these brain microchips like the world has never seen. And Elon Musk, he's one of the people that believes that he is creating technology to be embedded within us to save us from our doom of artificial intelligence. He literally, there's two streams of thoughts here. Either artificial intelligence is going to wipe out humanity or we merge with artificial intelligence to save the human race. Now, some of the short-term goals of Neuralink are to, you know, treat various brain disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease to move from there to help amputees and restore the ability to see, talk, and listen. But Elon Musk made it abundantly clear in that presentation that his overall goal is to truly become one. Symbiosis, truly symbiotic creatures with artificial intelligence. Mm. Now, this is, this is a thing. There's already been one BCI in the United States that has been FDA approved. And this current brain chip has 10 electrodes right now. And it's, you know, zapping different parts of, of our brain. Now, not in the sense of we're getting, you know, shocked, but zapping it in the sense of it, it's, it's, it's telling the neurons what to do. And it's, it's helping people with Parkinson's. And it's helping people uh, re reducing seizures that people with epilepsy are having. So the current BCIs, they are helping people right now on record in great ways with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. with epilepsy. And those current BCIs, Josh, they have 10 electrodes. The, the BCI that Neuralink is creating right now, which he says that he plans to embed within the human brain by the end of 2020, does not have 10 electrodes. It has 10,000 Wow. Electrodes. It will literally be 1,000 times better 
than anything that has ever been approved within the United States. Yeah, that, that's crazy to think about. And, and those, are, those are really good points to bring up with it. Because I've always said when, when it comes to, you know, things like this or, or what sometimes is called, you know, like Mark of the Beast technology and stuff like that, I, the, the main thing that I want to know before, uh, you know, anything else is, is it restorative or does it enhance, you know, basically? So d- d- is, does this technology enhance God's creation in some way, or is it restoring something that's been taken away? And that that factors in a lot with me. You know, I have a hip replacement, and I'm going to have to have an ankle replacement. I wear glasses. You know, I, I have a lot of, of restorative things that uh, but but it's because things that happened in my body go outside of uh, what what God's design already you know was for it. Like you know we we we're, we weren't we're not supposed to be born with bad eyesight. You know it's it's restoring mm-hmm. the eyesight, but it doesn't enhance the eyesight. I can't see through walls. You know not, it's it's nothing like that. It's still, it still it restores to a very uh, uh, human standard. Um, now, That's what very it, interesting. So that you're saying that the line in the in the sand for you is to where it restores to what the human body is. But you're saying if it ever gives you maybe yeah, this sounds funny to say, very sci-fi to say. But you're saying if it ever extends beyond beyond what the human has ever been, that is where you draw the line in the sand. Is that what you're saying? Well, it depends. I mean, yes and no, because there's the other factor that you brought up too. Um, it's like the, these these uh, brain implants. They're they're helping Alzheimer's people. It seems like you know on 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 paper, it seems like all they're doing is uh, restoring something that should be there, and that's great. But you also have to look at uh, how how the, the the potential for this technology to be abused. Can those chips be hacked at some point in the future? You know, exactly. If, and is that worth the risk? You know, maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. I, I think. Think that those types of things would have to be, uh, you know, conversations that individuals have with their family and their doctor and all that. I, I don't like. I don't think the, the from what I know about it, the the brain chips that are that are just merely trying to treat Parkinson's. Uh, the, if there if there is no no risk of getting, ha- I mean, there's always a risk that you know, in, in ten years somebody could develop a way to hack into these things and cause some damage. But but uh, you know, but barring all that. If it's worth the risk because the person gets the qual- gets a quality of life that's better uh, than than they're getting now, and it's not falling into enhancing uh, the the you know hu- what God created is to be human being, uh, then I think that that personally I think that that's okay. But but it's also something that um, that, that that I think the the individual has, has to decide for him or himself him or herself. Where I think the actual line is where it falls into sin or where it falls dangerously close with. Uh, you know, like flirting with the mark of the beast kind of stuff is when it when mm-hmm. it enhances the human body or changes it, especially uh, like on on a on a uh, like a DNA level. When 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 it alters somebody to the point where you, you you can't even recognize them as human anymore because there's something there there's something that's that's seen as better. You know, they're human plus, like the like what the transhumanists uh, mm-hmm. are, are are dreaming about. So that that to me is the line. But but even you know on an individual level, I could understand why somebody would not. Want Want uh, a brain implant, even if they, you know, ha- have some kind of uh, de- uh, debilitating disease, uh, for fear that it might be abused in the future. And you know, even in even in California, at this presentation of everything that Neuralink has been doing since 2017, you know, Elon Musk, uh, even though it was not listed in the white paper, and you actually saw that the main presenter, other than Elon, he was a little upset whenever Elon said this because they weren't supposed to announce this yet. But he had already said, "Listen, with our current BCIs, we already had, which have already been." Uh, embedded within several monkeys' brains, there's a particular monkey that we have that has been able to control the computer before him with the BCIs that we have already made, and that was that was alarming wow. to me, Josh. Let me tell you, I have I, I just wanted to give this little analogy because I feel like so many people have such a hard time being able to imagine what the future is going to look like, that it's good to bring them to the past and yeah. say, listen, if this cycle continues in the same way, if you were for someone to say in 1981, everything that the digital revolution was going to encompass, if they said, hey, listen, I have an idea of what this, this is what it would look like. They're going to be way far off. They're going to be mm-hmm. so far off because anybody trying to paint a picture, it's going to be very difficult, especially going to these new places. So here, here's something I wanted to bring up on the on today's program. It says this, the cost of a one gigabyte hard drive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Today you can go get one from Best Buy for basically a couple of bucks. Yeah. Did you know in 1993, 
IBM was selling a one gigabyte hard drive for $3,000, a one gigabyte hard drive for $3,000. Now, 10 years before that, one gigabyte, just 10 years before that, cost around $165,000 per gigabyte. Wow. Actually, it was in 1981 that Apple, to get a to get one gigabyte from Apple, it would have cost you around seven hundred thousand dollars for one. Wow. Now, just to, if, if you count inflation, that means one gigabyte today, and what would have been in 1981, seven hundred thousand dollars, that'd be two million dollars in today's dollar. You know, my my iPhone here being two hundred fifty six gigabytes. <laughs> that means that it'd be worth over $500 million. You can wow. buy an eight gigabyte flash drive today for $2 from Best Buy. Yeah. <laughs> Technology comparisons here are extended. The Apollo space module that landed on the moon only had a four kilobyte uh, of memory in their guidance computers. Mm. Okay, that's not even enough memory to display a photo of the module <laughs> on the internet. Wow. And, and I have several here. I'm just going to lift this last one. Yeah. In 1946, scientists at the University of Pennsylvania created what they call the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was one of the first computers. It was a 30-ton machine, okay, 60,000 pounds with 17,468 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, and 10,000 capacitors, and it occupied a room that was 30 feet by 50 feet. It was a calculator. <laughs> wow. I just described the first calculator in 1946. So my point is this. If you think brain microchips are going to stop at 10 electrodes, then you're not getting it. If you think they're going to stop at 10,000 electrodes, which are going to be embedded into the first human in 2020, then you're not getting it. It's everything is in an, in an, an incredible exponential fashion. Where BCIs, where brain chips are going to be in 20 years is going to be like you were describing just a few minutes ago, Josh, absolutely sci-fi in nature. It's insane to think about how fast this is uh, approaching and, and really just the whole technological era isn't very long, and it could have happened at any other point in history. I mean, ancient history, you look at spans of hun uh, you know hundreds of years or thousands of years, and they're pretty much the same. You know, in yes. any one of those eras, they could have had an industrial revolution. You know, they could have yes. had some, but for some reason, it, it was now. And, and so that, that I want to ask you, do you think that there's a reason behind that? Do you think Satan is behind this future technology? Because we hear about things like DMT and the sources of where... Uh, uh, they get their ideas and stuff like that. And I, I know that that's something else that you've looked into far more than I have. Do you, how, how does DMT play a factor in this, and who is really behind this technology? Sure. And so to, to address your first point, you're exactly right. Abraham of the Old Testament, for the most part, got from point A to point B in the same time and the same fashion as Abraham Lincoln did thousands of years later. Right. There has been a, an incredible amount of, of technology. That, but yes, I do believe that Satan is behind this. You know, even the, 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 the reason Satan loves technology, and like you said, we've got, we don't want to be so radical that we say all technology is bad. Right. But whenever we have learned from other filmmakers like Justin Fall, that even he, he brought that team to Burning Man. I actually learned about this at, at one of your conferences a couple of years ago. He learned that the tech elite are actually tripping on DMT. They're blasting off mm -hmm. and they're having demonic encounters where they are speaking to fallen angels. And these fallen angels are teaching people the technology to build was simply that little nugget of truth. Do you think that the end game of the current technology is for the benefit of the Christian if it's being taught to the tech elite by fallen angels? Absolutely not. Exactly. And so how is how is technology going to be used in the end times? Why does Satan love it? Because Satan wants to be like God. Right. The more that I study God and his kingdom, and the more that I'm in this type of news, I realize, my gosh, Satan literally, he wants to be, he wants to be everywhere, and he wants to be all powerful, and he wants a kingdom, and for his servants to execute his orders in the same way that God's ambassadors are to execute God's orders. 
It, mm. Here's the thing. So first of all, this is a super obvious. The clear takeaway of these BCIs could be linked to the mark. Okay. Right. Revelation chapter 13, and I'll read this and I'll get somewhere from this. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that's a clear spiritual takeaway from these brand microchips. But the chip is furthering Satan's kingdom and his false heaven on earth. He has, I'm telling you, Josh, it's crazy. He has a demonic parallel for everything that the Lord in its pure form has. Satan wants a kingdom like God, and he wants to be worshiped. Here's some of the demonic parallel. You see, God will demonstrate his seal of ownership Mm -hmm. on his servants in the end days with a mark on their foreheads. Obviously, we just read that Satan wants to do the same thing because he wants to be like God. And obviously we know that there's a false trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, which is a mimic of the holy, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Satan, I believe, will one day be all-knowing nearly Mm -hmm. through complete connectivity. You see, whenever I was at my time at True News, we did a lot of traveling around the world. There was a team of about five or six of us. We traveled to tons of different countries. And at one of those particular events – you had Masayoshi's son. First of all, he's the owner of Arm, which Arm produces almost every single microchip mm-hmm. in every single phone in the world. And so True News team was there listening near the front row to Masayoshi's son talking about the future of technology. So, yeah, he's the owner of Arm. He's the the main guy behind SoftBank, which is is not a bank, okay? It's a venture capitalist firm to invest in the future of everything IoT, primarily with artificial intelligence, and they're absolutely in bed with Saudi Arabia, and it just it's going to end up being, you know, one of the one of the pillars of the end times is is Masayoshi's SoftBank. He's also the richest man in all of Japan even though he's of South Korean descent. But he's talking about in the age of singularity, which he says is going to be around 2040 to 2042 is what he wrote on record saying in Barcelona, Spain. Mm -hmm. And in that day, whenever microchips literally have an IQ of 10,000, okay, as comparatively speaking to someone like Einstein, which was probably somewhere around 200, which would be absolutely incredible, insane if he even was that high. Right. Now, in in the age of singularity, whenever you literally have every chip having the knowledge of of 10,000, that's superhuman. That is superhuman intelligence. Now, but what he said was this, our goal is to put microchips in everything. Mm. And then he literally said, I mean, absolutely everything. There will be with a T trillions of microchips. He says, everything your eyes can see will have a microchip. He goes from 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 the from the glasses you're wearing to the silverware that you're eating with. He goes in your shoes, you will be stepping on intelligence with an IQ of 10,000. And wow. then he talked about how all of this is going to be fed back to what he referred to as a global brain. So you literally have every single thing in the world in this time period of, of the age of singularities they call it around 2040 with microchips in everything, super intelligence collecting data in real time and sending it to what he referred to as a global brain. Well, who's going to control this system? Right. Do you realize that that means everything in the world will basically be able to be recorded and relayed in real time? Essentially, whoever has power of this, they would know the numbers of hair on your head. They would know if a sparrow falls to the ground. I'm saying that this is going to be used for an end times agenda. I believe that the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the 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 man doomed to destruction, he will be in control of this system. And as you know, the promises of Neuralink. Think mm-hmm. about this, Josh. The early stages uh, of Neuralink, like I said, is to is to treat brain disorders, right? Like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. This is great. This is wonderful. This is good stuff, right? But then it says, then we move from there to help amputees, and to restore the ability to see, to talk, and to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay? What he's basically saying is they're they're saying with the tech they're building right now, they're promising that they're going to be able to give sight to the blind. Mm. The deaf will hear. The lame will walk. 
and those oppressed from brain disorders such as schizophrenia, seizures, autism, or any other brain disorders, they'll be healed. Mm. In whose name ultimately? Right. And it's by taking this chip. Satan is in this. And like I said, once again, going back to Justin Fall, DMT, this spirit, this crazy psychedelic spirit drug that people are taking. And right now, it's really had a, a resurgence in America since around 2006. And I was reading an article just a couple of weeks ago that they believe that there are a few million people smoking this in America alone every single day year. And wow. we've, we've talked about it before. I've talked about it. You've talked about it, that DMT isn't necessarily a recreational drug. Right. You're not smoking it to have a good time. It's not like, it's like, well, Zach, okay, well, people are getting drunk by the millions every week and people are smoking pop by the millions every weekend. People are taking opioids uh, by the millions every weekend. Okay. Listen, that's because people are making those into recreational drugs. DMT is not. I've sat down and talked with so many people that literally say, I I have smoked at one time. I will never be the same. My eyes have been opened. I've been shown the light. I'm no longer uh, an atheist. I'm quoting many people, but I'll only do it one time. Now, for right. the brave and brave in, in spirit, they might even have a uh, a one year cleanse around the new year. They might smoke DMT, and then it, you know, if you're a little braver than that, some of these tech titans they'll microdose a little bit, not to go on this full radical experience, but. Mushrooms, peyote, you know, these other psychedelics, you know, if you and I took mushrooms, we'd still stay in this same reality, Josh. We'd right. still stay here right now and we would just be simply seeing different things. But so many people will take DMT together. They'll all lie on their bed for 15 minutes and blast off and they'll have nearly the exact same experience, but not in this reality. There was a, there was a breakout session at Burning Man last mm -hmm. year where – they were literally teaching young executives the benefits of microdosing DMT. Jeez. I mean, this is breakout sessions? <laughs> Was this a conference? Teaching young executives how to successfully microdose, take small amounts of DMT to be enlightened throughout your week, to, to, to produce more creativity throughout your week. And these are the things, and this is this all plays into technology. The technology that I mean, I mean, how more how much obvious. Can you be the the leading phone? The leading smartphone in the world is literally an Apple mm -hmm. with a bite taken out of it. And I know I'm not saying anything that you or I, or your audience, doesn't know, but it's just it's right there in front of us. And I do believe it's been inspired by uh, Satan. Absolutely, it's plain as day uh, for for those who you know know what to look for. For those who are looking for it, let, let me ask you this because I know right now in our uh, in our in our modern age, you know, just like basically today, the worst things uh, in, involving involving tech that Christians have to worry about is usually centered around censorship. You know, I, I get hit hard with this. I know you do too. Uh, we we as Christians in our modern age, we we get censored. But in the future, if all of this technology continues, uh, it's gonna. I think it's going to go far past uh, just mere censorship. I think it's going to get much worse. How do you think this technology is going to be used against Christians in the future? The social media companies, which are absolutely working with our government, they have created a digital twin mm -hmm. of who you are. And the thing is this, the government knows exactly who you are through your digital twin. Right. They know everything about you. And people need to come to grips that five years from today, President Donald Trump will not be our president. Mm -hmm. The election is coming in about one year. So let's just say five and a half years in the future. Donald Trump will not be our president. Right. And Obama's America is coming back and it's going to not necessarily run by Obama, but the uh, the wickedness is going to be increased. And people just need to remember that with what I'm about ready to say, because we are in a reprieve and a reprieve is just a postponement before the judgment comes. What they know about you is startling, your digital twin. Let me read a list for you. Let's just talk about Google for a moment. Mm -hmm. What does Google know about you? Google knows who you are. They know your appearance, thanks to facial recognition. Uh, they know your voice, your religious and political beliefs, your health status, 
your personal details. They know everywhere you've been. Location tracking is one of areas that Google excels in. They know where your home is. They know where your office is. They track and record your location through several different means, Wi-Fi, GPS, cellular networks. This means that the phone knows everywhere you are every day and how long you're there for. That's how they know where your home is and where your office is. They know the places you visit, the places you've traveled. They know who your friends are, who uh, you talk to. If you use Gmail for one of your personal or, or work accounts, they know where you meet, what you talk about. Google keeps track of what you talk about over Gmail. Mm. What you like and dislike, it's how the search engine creates and sells you those personal, uh, personalized advertisements. Right. They know the books uh, you read, the food you like to eat, the movies you watch, where you shop and what you buy. They know your future plans. The company can also use data from their applications and search engines to make predictions about what, about what you'll be doing in the future. Hmm. What you're wow. interested in buying, seeing, yep. eating, upcoming trips and reservations, future life plans. Have you been searching about home ownership, about when the best age to have children is, what, about tips for traveling to another country? They can predict what you're going to do in the future. And they know, obviously, your online life, the websites you visited, your browsing habits. You literally have given them a digital twin of yourself. They know you better than probably your best friends do. They right. know who you are when no one else is even around. Mm -hmm. That government knows you. Now, here's the thing. Josh, they already know who they are. They know who the future enemies are. Like I said, Obama's America is coming back. President Donald Trump cannot be the president for the rest of our lives. And right. so let us not forget it was even back in 2009. I have it here. It, this is uh, this is an unclassified assessment that was released by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. They know who you are. They have your digital twin. And one day you will be labeled as a terrorist. Let's have a little uh, history lesson on who the Department of Homeland Security labeled as a terrorist in 2009. So mm -hmm. this is called right-wing extremism. Current economic and political climate fueling resurgence and radicalization and recruitment. This is actually from, and you can get this from uh, DHS's website. Who do they label a terrorist? How will this tech be used against you? Hey, how about revisiting the 1990s? Paralleling the current national climate, so they're comparing it, of what it is, what it was in 2009 to the 1990s and who they label as these extremists. Right-wing extremists during the 1990s exploited a variety of social issues and political themes to increase group visibility. Yeah, because that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. prominent, prominent among these themes were the militias movement – now we're militia – to oppose gun control efforts. Hmm. These are the terrorists. Uh, you're labeled as a terrorist if you criticize free trade agreements. You're a right-wing extreme terrorist. And hi they highlighted perceived government infringements on civil rights. Uh, also, extremists, they exploit social issues such as abortion and same-sex marriage. Mm. Do you – are you stand in opposement of abortion and same-sex marriage? Well, then you're an extremist in America. This was Obama's America. Wow. Here's some more. Uh, domestic right-wing extremists have feared – predicted and anticipated a cataclysmic economic collapse in the United States. Prominent anti-government conspiracy theories have incorporated aspects of an impending economic collapse. Yeah, sure. I can absolutely see that. You're labeled as an extremist if you believe in conspiracy theories such as declarations of martial law, yeah. impending civil strife or racial conflict. You are an extremist if you believe in conspiracy theories such as the suspension of the U.S. Constitution and the creation of citizen detention camps. This is in the Department of Homeland Security. Wow. Yes. You're an extremist if you believe in conspiracy theories such as anti-government conspiracy theories and oh, oh anti-government conspiracy theories and end time prophecies. Uh, what motivate – would motivate extremist individuals and groups to even stockpile food, ammunition, and 
weapons. This technology is already there. They've already created a digital twin. Donald Trump is not going to be president forever. And Obama's America is coming back. So there's a flashback to what Obama's America was and exactly who they labeled as the extremists and who they labeled as the terrorists. It was you and I. It was right wing. They call us extremists. It just means good conservative Christian people. That's that's who the extremists are to them. And so here's the thing. The left, the liberal left, their enemies are the same enemies that the Antichrist will have one day. Right. How wild is that? Yeah. That it is literally conspiracy theorists that believe in end time prophecy that stand against abortion and, and homosexuality. Their enemy is the same enemy that the Antichrist will have. That's a wow. scary that's that's a that's a scary thought. What can Christians do about it today? And then ultimately, how will God prevail against all of this? Absolutely. So first of all, how how do we prevail right now is get the word out. Mm-hmm. Talk about take your Bible to your unbelieving friends. First off, share the gospel. If if they, if they really are unbelieving, they don't know Jesus, share the gospel of Jesus with them. But as far as end times events, take them to the scriptures that clearly identify the days that we're living in right now. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. So how, how will God prevail against this? Um, it's incredibly easy. And I wrote a little, this is as simple as this. Jesus Christ, he's going to come back to earth. And he's going to destroy the Antichrist. There it is. Everything Amen. that he is, everything that he is building, he is he is orchestrating the, his plans to literally dominate and take over God and His earth. Uh, well, Jesus is going to come back and destroy the Antichrist. The devil will then be bound for one thousand years, and for a thousand years, we're going to have a period of peace on earth. Men will no longer be under demonic oppression. It will be a time of love, brotherhood, brotherhood, and no more war. Even the animals will be at peace. And at the end of this time, yes, after man has been in paradise, uh, that results when God's will is done on earth, the devil, he will be set free for a a limited time. He will lead one final assault on God, but he'll lose. Mm -hmm. It's already written. This is a part of God's sovereign will. And he's going to be cast into the lake of fire with all of his angels, and he's going to be there for all of eternity with no possibility of escape. This is how this is how God overcomes. The Bible is prophecy. And God God shows himself that he is real and he is the God of the Bible because he fulfills his prophecies. Most of the Old Testament is literally prophecies. Yeah. Jesus has fulfilled so many of them. We know that the God of the Bible is the God of the Bible. So why would we ever be led to believe that he's fulfilled the large majority of the prophecies in the Bible, but he's not going to fulfill the end prophecies? Right. He absolutely will. He's absolutely going to prevail. By the breath of his mouth, everything will be done. It will be over in Jesus's name. And we're literally going to live in an incredible eternity with God forever and ever and ever. I love it. We've already won. That's ultimately our hope. Our our hope is in Jesus Christ. And if we have our hope in Jesus Christ, we don't have to have fear in the Antichrist. And uh, (laughs) that's absolutely amazing. What great information. Hey, before we let you go today, we have have a special announcement to make. We have a a, a cruise that we're uh, we're putting on. Why don't you tell people about that? Yeah. So actually, Josh and I, we're going to be doing a ministry cruise in September of 2020. It's going to be from the 6th to the 13th. And like I said, it's a Caribbean cruise. It's going to be on the Royal Caribbean ship, and it is called Harmony of the Seas. It is their newest and largest ship as of last year. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Josh and I, we're going to be speaking every uh, evening. That is not a port day, so we're not going to ever interfere with your activities that you have on the islands. So just on the days that we're at sea, we're going to be ministering in the evening time. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence. We're going to be talking about new age. We're going to be talking about, obviously, political topics as the election will literally be a month and a half from that time period. Um, and, And if you want to go on this cruise with Josh and I, you need to sign up through heavenlycruises.com. That's heavenlycruises.com. Or you can call 209-588-9565 and just ask for Pastor Sharon. This will be in September of 2020. And if you go through heavenlycruises.com, you can actually even make 
payments with 0% interest, obviously. I mean, just payments until the cruise is uh, coming around the corner. And so it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Uh, please check that out. We want to, you to be a part of it. We've reserved a conference room for up to 300 people, but you have to book it through heavenlycruises.com to be a part of that number. Absolutely. And I have a feeling that that is going to sell out fast uh, because, uh, you know, again, you know, it, very, very limited uh, in, in terms of numbers, but it's going to be it's going to be a blast. We have some really important information to to relate to you guys. And we also just want to fellowship with you and get get to get to know you personally. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before you go, thank can you, you tell people? Me. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Can you tell people where they can find your show? Do you have a website? What What is uh, all of your online links? To view everything online, as far as the website goes, it's ZachDrewShow.com. ZachDrewShow.com. We post all of our videos there. You can also just simply type in Zach Drew Show on uh, YouTube and Facebook. We're also on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire uh, through the PTL Television Network. So if you have any of those systems, just type in PTL Television Network, and my show will be listed there. Fantastic. And, and for everybody at home, if you're a fan of Into the Multiverse, you're going to love the Zach Drew Show. So I highly suggest uh, and recommend that you go and check it out. Well, Zach, thank you again for coming on the show and making time for this. It's uh, it's always good talking with you. And uh, wow, what a load of, uh, of, of information that you were able to provide for the audience. Uh, I, I suggest people go back and rewatch the interview because Amen. it is just loaded with information. But thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Josh. I appreciate being here.